which they do from time to time. They mourn, in fact, they are distraught about the very fact of remaining saved in their lives. So in Romans 7, for example, Paul bemoans this struggle in his life. When I want to do that which is good, he says, I find that evil is present with me. He continues to say that with my mind I serve the law of God. But in my members I find another law. Battling against the law of my mind. And because of that continuing struggle, he cries out in verse 24. He mourns. Who will deliver me from this body of death? And that is a Christian. He realizes the fact of remaining sick in him and he mourns over that. But he also demands the fact of the sin that surrounds him. When the behavior of sinners around him dishonor God and the name of Christ. His heart is broken. He is not one who looks at sin and dismisses it as if it is nothing. He is moved to holy anger towards it. He is not indifferent, for example, when things like the struggles we see in the Middle East that are going on even now. He mourns over those. That is what a true Christian looks like. He has experienced a poverty of spirit. He mourns over it. But if those two things are true of a person, they will lead to the third beatitude or the third blessing that our Lord Christ speaks of in the fifth verse. So it is Matthew 5 and verse 5. Blessed are the meek. For they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are the meek. For they shall inherit the earth. How did this meekness come to be in the life of this person? It is because they are deep awareness of their wretchedness and inability as sinners. And their awareness of uh, the just condemnation of God that they deserve as sinners and that fact has brought them on their knees 
Na hiyo ndiyo imewaleta katika magoti yao. To mourn over their sins. Weza kuhuzunikia dhambi zao. Their natural sinful pride has been broken. Kwamba hali yao ya hasira ya dhambi imeweza kuvunjwa. That arrogance and sense of entitlement that is native to the human heart has been crushed by the foregoing two graces. Sasa kwamba hali yao ya dhambi na ujasiri katika dhambi imevunjwa na heri zile mbili za mwanzo. They are no longer looking for a place of prominence for themselves. Kwamba hawatazamii hali ya kuwa sawa kwa kile place of prominence mali maarufu hawatazamii kuwa na maarufu kwa mbele kwa mbele kwa mbele because they are deeply aware maana wanao fahamu that if i am to be put on a pedestal somewhere i on on a, on a, on a platform somewhere kwamba kama ningewekwa mahali pa mimiuliwa and everybody was to see me as i truly am kwamba mtu aweze kunifahamu jinsi nilivyo ni kweli there is nothing good they will see me hamna jema lolote wanaloweza kuniona ndani yao so they don't like to put themselves forward sasa basi si watu wa kujitanguliza mbele they are not constantly looking for this first place where everybody will see them kwamba si watu ambao wanatangulia kutaka kujulikana na kujiweka mbele si the pride has been crushed kama ile kiburi inaweza kuondoswa if i want to ask you kama ningeweza kuuliza the ordinary way in which we human beings get ahead in life kama njia ya kawaida ya vile sisi wanadamu tunaendelea na maisha how do we succeed Paul Vick say in business uh, labda katika biashara or in a place of work labda mahali pale pa kazi or in our various relations ama katika mahusiano yetu tofauti tofauti what is the recipe that the world prescribes for success ni nini ambayo ulimwengu uh, unazingatia katika mali ya ufanisi i would dare say it is something like this sema kwamba ni jambo kama hili it is by being aggressive ni kuwa mtu ambaye kwa aggressive yeah kuji sawa you put yourself forward you know? mtu ambaye unajiweka mbele na unajitolea sahihi somebody who is a you know a god getter mtu ambaye anaisukuma ili kuweza kupata kila kakazi i think there is the, the, the new one we have in our country there is a hustler sikuwa is a hustler. One who wrestles his way ahead. Mtu ambaye anafanya juu chini ili akaweze kufaulu. Who does everything inside and outside of the book to gain advantage. Fanya lolote awezalo ili kuweza kujifanikisha. That is how you get ahead in life. Ndiyo ndio unalofaulu kimaisha. This one is very competitive world. Kama ni ulimwengu ambao umejaa mashindano. Everybody is wanting a share of it. Kila mtu anataka kipande katika ulimwengu huu. And if you're going to get anything out of it, kama utapokea lolote basi, then you go to hustle your way. Lazima utafutie njia. And if need be trample a few people out of food. Na ikiwezekana basi ukanyage watu kadhaa ndio kaweze kukutia. If you are too careful about people's sensitivities and feelings na kama basi utakuwa msingatifu wa hisia za wanadamu if you are the kind of person who stands on the queue and you see for example a pregnant woman standing behind you and you want to give them room so that you know when i go anywhere they say kama wewe utakuwa mtu wa hisia kwa mfano ungempata mtu ambaye ni mjamzito kaweze kumpisha hauke faulu katika ulimwengu wa sasa those who get ahead in life those who make their way through this life are those put themselves forward. Wana ambao wana faulu katika kizazi hiki ni wana ambao wanakipeana wanajisukuma ili wakaweze kufaulu. They are the fighters. Wana ambao wapiganaji. 
That's what the world says. But look at the paradox in the words of our Lord Christ in verse 5. Who are those people who will inherit the earth? To whom the earth in the truest sense really belongs. It's not to such as we just described in the last few moments. But the Bible says it is those who are meek. It's not quite what you would have expected. But that's what Jesus says. Now you find uh, that to be very common in all these beatitudes. They are paradoxes. Our Lord Christ presents situations which seem to run counter the grain of what we know in this life. That happy are those who are poor. And happy are those who are actually mournful. Now he tells us that those who really get ahead in life are those who are meek. But it is true because that is what our Lord Christ says. Now we will attempt to define the word shortly. But one commentator has observed about this character of witness. He said, Dr. Martin Lloyd Jones. By the Dr. Jones. Speaking about meekness, he says that it's a much more difficult thing to ask of us, even than the previous two. Because those previous two are fairly personal to us. We are poor in spirit when we perceive ourselves as we really are. Now, if we are honest with ourselves, we will acknowledge ourselves as we are. And that's, that's a little easy. The second one of mournfulness is also relatively easy. Because when we see ourselves as we are, and then we realize that we are standing in the presence of the Holy God, then we know that the rightful response that must emanate from us is one of mourning. And many of us are willing to acknowledge what we are, what our duties are, when we stand before God, because we know we cannot hide anyway. So I acknowledging ourselves as we are in our own eyes a little bit easy. Acknowledging ourselves as we stand before God a little bit easy. But he observed that what makes meekness a much more difficult version is that it is a virtue that finds expression particularly in how we relate one to the people around us and two 
to the circumstances in our lives. Let me illustrate this to you. It is easier for you to look at yourself when you've done something wrong and chide yourself say, I have done something wrong. It might even be easier for you to stand before God and here God tells you you have done something wrong. He's God. But when it is a fellow human being, a brother or sister in the Lord, who now sees the sin in your life and wants to point it out. Now that's a lot more difficult to stand. We can self-criticize, we can allow God to criticize us, but when fellow men see ourselves, we're not very comfortable. That becomes difficult. Now meekness requires, among other things, that aspect of faith, is it? How do we interact with people? How do we respond to people? I, I should show you shortly. It is also when our environment or our circumstances treat us as our sins deserve. Then we are not very happy. And that's why one of the most common questions we hear people asking when they travel is, why me? What wrong did I do to deserve this or the other? I think the right question should be this. When bad things are happening to me, my environment is treating me in a way I don't like, I should be asking myself, why not? Because I know that these things are a consequence of sin, aren't they? And so, but for the grace of God, all that I deserve is every single thing that is happening to me and even worse. Now, meekness requires us to respond to our circumstances in our environment in that way. And that's hard. But our Lord Christ requires it of us in Matthew 5 and verse 5. Blessed are the meek. And then he will say that only they will inherit them. Now let, let's, let's attempt something of a definition of meekness. And, and I'm saying attempt because it is a term that is notoriously difficult to define. Because many mistake it for another word which sounds similar, but for the beginning letter, the word weak. Meekness is not weakness. Anasema kwamba ni swala ambalo linafanganya na jambo lingine kuu. 
ukiwa pamoja una pole na na udhaifu pole na udhaifu so, so, so sometimes we mistake meekness for weakness kati mwingine tunachukua lingine kudhani kwamba ni lingine we think, we think make people as spineless people uh cowardly people without any courage or, you know ndani kwamba watu wa pole basi ni watu ambao ni wa dhaifu watu wa mawezi what I want us to do in order to get a sense of what this word means kila watu ningependa kufanya ili tukaweze kufahamu jambo hili la maana we could have done it in a number of ways we could have done it a what study for back the great we can do that naweza kufanya hilo kwa kuzingatia greek na tunaweza kufanya hivyo but i think it's much more helpful to look at the words of christ himself kinatumai kwamba ni vyema zaidi tukasikatia maneno ya mkristo mwenyewe even ask ourselves if these words have any context na kujiuliza kama maneno haya yenyewe yako na mkutadha and if they do have a context what is the meaning of this word in that particular context kama inayo mtadha basi maneno haya yana maanisha nini katika mtadha ule now the verse itself goes like blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth na kifungu chenyewe ni hiki heri wenye pole maana hao watahiriki inchi what does christ have in mind kristo ana nini akili I have convinced that Christ has in mind the 37th Psalm. Ana ameshawishika kwamba Kristo akona akona akonaye aklini Zaburi ya 100 Zaburi ya 37 37 Psalm. Zaburi ya 37 From where he almost borrows directly. Na hapo ndipo ana mkuu maneno yale moja kwa moja. And I think if we look at the context of uh, that stuff where Christ borrows we might get a sense of what he has in mind na kama tunazingatia mahali ambapo Kristo ana mikuu maneno hayo tunaweza kupata ina maanisha nini so we can get a helpful understanding of what it means to be meek ili tukaweze kufahamu ina maanisha nini huwa na upole now the third second psalm is a psalm of david zaburi ya 37 na 7 ni zaburi ya daudi its main trust is this that the lord will not forsake his people and that thought is brought us in psalm 37 in the context of an appearance of the abandonment of the people of God. Na inaletwa kwetu katika mkutadha wa watu wa kwa watu wa Mungu. Bad things seem to be happening to them. Na kama mambo mabaya yanawatukia watu hawa. Even though they fear God, japo kuwa wao wanamuogopa Mungu. And in that the seven psalm we also see that good things appear to be happening to those who don't fear God. Naona pia kwamba mambo mema yanachukia wale ambao wanafaa hawamheshimu Mungu. And because of that setup, na kwa sababu ya ufahamu huo, it is very easy for the godly person, ni rahisi kwa watu ambao wanamcha Mungu to be moved to envy, kuweza kuingiwa na wivu, to be moved to competition, kuweza kuingiwa na mashindano, to be moved to retaliation, kuweza kizana na hayo na hiyo to be moved to try to hustle his way out of his predicament and to be something like what the wicked person is weza kufanya bidii ili kujiondoa kuzingatia wale mazuri ambao watu wabaya wako nayo so there will be a contrast here between uh, the godly person the righteous person and the ungodly person sasa kuna hapo mambo mawili kati ya mtu ambaye anamcha Mungu na mtu ambaye anamchi Mungu and the meek that Christ is referring to in Matthew 5:5 sasa pole ambao Kristo anaelezea katika Mathayo 1:1 is in fact the righteous person in Psalm 37 inazingatia mtu mwenye haki katika Zaburi ya 37 now look at the following uh, words as Christ uses them 
Ingatia maneno ambayo Kristo anavyoyatumia. Verse 11. Mstari wa 11. Psalms 37 and verse 11. Zaburi 37 mstari wa 11. He says, but the meek shall inherit the Mabali wenye upole wanaelekea So you see Christ actually got his word directly Psalm 37 and verse 11. The meek shall inherit the, the land and delight themselves in an abundance of peace. Look at verse 22 again. For those blessed by the Lord shall inherit the land. So the meek is the one who is blessed of the Lord. Hence Christ was blessed are the meek. Look at verse 29. The righteous shall inherit the land and dwell upon it forever. When you have you what I did the inchi now what I found who mileni. So the blessed man is the meek man. He is also the righteous man. As a mutual man, the very few one, the young pole, the young when you have you. And you can find that even in verse uh, thirty-four. We are asked to wait for the Lord. Again, you see the context is not very good things are happening to the righteous. The good things seem to be happening to the wicked. The righteous is being tempted to get agitated and irritated and anxious to push his way around. But he is here adding the father for to wait for the Lord. Because the Lord will exalt him to inherit the land. Now, now the point is this. If we have to understand what Christ has in mind when he talks about the meat in Matthew 5. We will not understand the blessed, righteous, meek, patient man of Psalm 37. Lazima tufahamu mtu mpole mwenye haki aliyebarikiwa wa Zaburi ya 37. Because what we see in this person kila mtu tunakiona katika mtu huyo is what will constitute him a, a meek man. Na hiyo hiyo ndio itaashiria mtu ambaye ni pole. Now very quickly let's go through this psalm and see what the Bible has to say about this meek man. If you look at verse 1, he does not get agitated when he sees wicked people around him prospering. He is not envious of wrongdoers. Instead, verse 3, we are told, he trusts. In the Lord. And so you find then that the man who is meek has, has as his essential character a settled trust in God. Look at verse 4. We are told that he delights himself in the Lord. In other words, he so loves the Lord that the things that the Lord loves are the things that he loves. He is chiefest joy is not things, it is not status, it is in fact the Lord. Kwamba, kwa swala ambalo 
amezingatia zaidi sio mambo yote yale bali ni Bwana mwenyewe. Look at verse 5. Tare batano. He is a person who is holy surrender to God. Ni mtu ambaye amejikabidhi kwa Bwana mtakatifu. He commits his way to the Lord. Anapeana njia yake kwa Bwana. He is one who says as the Lord will now if the Bible is telling the morning you are talking about the providence of God chapter 5 of the confession here is a man who has settled in that reality who you need to abide amen he will do what he must, what he can. And then he will leave the outcomes to go. He commits his way to go. Look at verse 7. He is patient. He has a stillness about him. He is not one who is easily moved in mind or in heart. Not by the provocations of men. And certainly not by the changes in the very circumstances of his life. Look at verse 8. He's a man who has his anger under control. He reigns in him. Not that he doesn't have it, he's there, but he puts it in check. Now you get a picture here of someone who in the midst of much provocation from evil doers and from his own circumstances is so settled in God but he is not moved easily by what is going on around him. Now contrast him with the wicked person. Look at verse 12. How does the opposite of a meek man look like? What, 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 what does the opposite look like? We are told that the wicked is one who is constantly plotting, planning evil, devising, conniving against the righteous. We are told in verse, in verse um, 14. That he is a wicked person. He is willing to draw the sword. In other words, he is willing to use violent means. He does not mind hurting others. And particularly hurting the righteous. If he thinks that that would gain him some advantage, he is willing to oppress, to do violence, to harm, to hurt. To assert himself in every way. Regardless of what that means to those who are around him. Now, to the contrary, the meek person, the righteous person, the blessed person, has come to an understanding 
amefikia ufahamu but if you get ahead in that aggressive way kama unapoendelea katika hali yako kutafuta njia weza you whatever advantage you gain will not last kwamba chochote ambacho utapata hakitaweza kuwa cha kudumu now we see this wicked man doing the best they can to gain advantage he will connive and plot if he has to but he will use violence if he has to but uh, 21 he will borrow without an intention of repaying if he has to atakopa bila kutaka kurudisha and he might appear to gain advantage na, by those means na na kuwa mtazamo kujifaidisha katika jambo hilo but the righteous man has looked at his end ni mtu mwenye haki amezingatia hatima yake and he knows it doesn't end well with him na anajua kama haiendei vyema yeye look at verse 2 zingatia mstari wa 2 Even though this evil doer seems to be doing very well by these means yet Basu tells us that they will soon fade like the grass they will wither like the green herb verse 9 tells us that the evil doer will in fact be cut off naambiwa mstari wa 9 kwamba watenda mabaya hawa wataharibiwa if you look at um, verse um, 13 fifteen, seventeen, twenty. 20 ikatia mstari wa 15 hadi shuli you find the idea repeated again and again that advantage gained by that evil doer will not last naambiwa kwamba nafasi ambayo wameichukua watu hawa huko haitakuwa ya kudumu. The righteous man has seen that. Na kwamba mtu mwenye haki amejua hilo. But he has not seen that even though the meek righteous blessed perfect man might take a while to get there. Pia anajua kwamba mtu huyu ambaye ni mwenye haki, mtu mpole, mtu huyu anaweza kuchukua muda kuweza kufikia pale. In the final analysis the law will vindicate him hatimaye mtu huyu ataweza kuinuliwa na Bwana. Look at verse 4 to 6. Ikatia mstari wa 4 na mstari wa 6. Verse 4 ultimately the Lord will give you the desires of it. Huyu mtu ataweza kupewa a a matakwa ya moyo wake. Verse 5 as he trusts the Lord ultimately the law will act. Na Bwana anapum tumaini Bwana Bwana ataweza kufanya kazi. Verse 6 the Lord will bring out his righteousness like uh, the light is just this like the noon day so kama anaitokeza haki yake kwake mtu huyu kama nuru kama ya dhuhur and such things are repeated verse 9 verse 11 the truth the three to nine that in four and verse 37 mambo haya yamerudiwa mtaratisa vile vile tena sawa so he knows the lord will vindicate the meek ndio kwamba hatimaye bwana ataweza kubariki mtu huyu So you see that what we see from the portrait that is painted for us in this psalm is that the meek man is one who has such trust in God kwamba mtu mpole ni yule mtu ambaye ameweka sadikio lake katika Bwana. He has such dependence upon God. Yeye ana ule utegemezi kwa Mungu. Having looked at his utter inability and mold of his own sins, baada ya kujizingatia vile hawezi na ameuzunikia dhambi yake. He knows that nothing good will come out of his own efforts. Anajua kwamba hamna lolote litatokana na nguvu yake mwenyewe. He has cast himself fully to the Lord. Yeye amekupa kikamilifu mbele. Now the psalmist also tells us. Zaburi vile vile anatuambia. The such a person is characterized by two other things. Si huyu pia anaangaliwa katika hali mbili. In verse 16 He's a man who is very content. 
He's very content. For him, better is a little than the righteous has than the abundance of the wicked. His one who has understood that godliness with contentment is great gain. Now this doesn't mean that this person does not want the good things of life. He does. This does not mean that this person doesn't care about whether people treat him right or wrong. He actually does. But it means this. He lives it to God. It is always, it is on time to do him good. And whatever the Lord brings, he is content. He receives it with thanksgiving. So that the meek man is often a very content man, very contented. It is very difficult to unsettle a contented man. But the other thing we see about this meek person in Psalm 37 is that he is, he is very generous of spirit. He says, Look at verse 21. As the wicked borrows and never returns, the righteous is generous and gives. Why is he so generous as to give? Because he trusts in the Lord who is his provision. Look at verse 22. Rather, verse 26. Still more is told us about his generous spirit. He is ever lending generously, and his children become a blessing. Now, this is the portrait of a meek person that Psalm 37 paints. The man who has cast himself entirely and totally at the feet of the Lord. He trusts him in every way for everything. And that reflects in how he relates with his environment and with the people he interacts with. He's not easily provoked. He is not unnecessarily aggressive. He is not anxious or agitated. He is not pushy and, uh, you know, violent. Even when these things are being meted out against him, he is not one who is clamoring for advantage at every cost. He is of a mild character. That means he is not fierce. In word or in action. He is circumspect in his speech. He is one who is so generous. He is even willing in the language of the book of heaven to be plundered, to lose, to suffer wrong. That caused wrong himself. So if you were to be given a choice, either I will cause somebody wrong or I will receive wrong, he would rather be the recipient of wrong than the cause of it. 
Mama yuko tayari kupokea ubaya kuliko kusababisha ule ubaya. That is the meat man that Christ has in mind. He's the one who wants to always draw attention to himself. Now that's difficult, isn't it? When you see that the scripture of meekness is harder, especially if you consider that this character is required for us or from us, in the midst of a fallen people in a fallen world. It is not one of those traits that will easily give you an age in life. And that is why meekness is often mistaken for weakness. But it really takes much strength if you think about it to be meek, to do the thing that meekness requires. It requires a very strong person. Now that is my feeble attempt as a definition of or a portrait of what meekness looks like. Now the second thing I want to do very quickly is to show you again from the scripture that meekness is a distinctly Christ-like character. To be meek is really what it means to be like Christ. Now it is interesting that in Matthew chapter 11 verse 28 and 29 we find the one place in the gospel where Christ actually describes himself. He ascribes to himself a character. And the many traits that are ascribed to him by others but this one he has cried to himself. And it is not that I am the most powerful person you'll ever see. No, he doesn't say that of himself. Or I am the smartest person around. He doesn't say that of himself. But that character that Christ directly claims for himself is that he is meek and lowly of spirit. And then he invites us who believe in him to take upon ourselves his yoke. See, meekness is not an easy thing, it's a hard thing, isn't it? I mean, what do you think about Christ standing at the gates of Samaria, for example? At the gates of Samaria. At the gates. And wanting to go in to preach and do miracles. And people of Samaria stand against him and they say, no, you cannot come in here. And his disciples, knowing how powerful he is, they tell him, Master, command us to call fire from heaven. These people, what does Jesus tell you? You do not know of what spirit you are. How do we know you are? They couldn't stand it. We are able to push our way through here. 
Christ more than all of them knew he was more than able to do it. But what does he do? He turns back and walk, walks away. It's a bad thing. It's not easy. When it is easy to run away when you know you can't do anything. But when you know that all power in heaven and on earth belongs to you. You think about that next time you are in an argument with somebody. And they say something to you. And you know you have an answer for this one. You have an answer for this. And it can easily give a repartee and response. And the answer is there. It's a beautiful one. And you know as soon as you give that answer, you will silence them. And the debate will just come to an end immediately. How much does it take to hold back and not give that answer? So it is a yoke, it's a body, it takes strength. So Christ who says, I am meek and lowly of spirit. And then he invites us to take up that yoke of meekness upon ourselves. And to learn from him. Meekness is a distinctly Christ-like character. Now, we see him as Christ that himself. We see that meekness talked about as it regards Christ in the Bible. For example, in Matthew chapter 12, let's look at chapter 12, yeah? And verse 18 to 20. Let's look at how meek Jesus Christ looks like. It is said of him. And of course, this is a quotation from the prophecy of Isaiah. Um, in Isaiah. It is said of him. Did I say verse 18 to 20? Yes. 18 to 20. Here's what he says. Be all my servant whom I have chosen. My beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him and he will proclaim justice to Gentiles. And look at verse 19. He will not quarrel or cry out loud. Nor will anyone hear his voice in the street. In a nutshell, what the prophet is saying, and which is being quoted here, is he is not going to be the kind of person who agitates for what he considers his right or seeks to draw attention to himself. Look at verse 20. A bruised reed he will not break. A smoldering wick he will not quench. Look at how he deals with the weak and the vulnerable. The wicked in Psalm 37 looks at the weak, looks at the vulnerable, and it crushes them. And he steps over the head to gain advantage for himself. Not so our Lord Christ. Look at Matthew 21 and verse 5. 
Again, what we have recorded there is a fulfillment of Zechariah 9 and verse 9. Nine, nine. Where Jesus enters Jerusalem for the last time before his crucifixion. And it is saying to Jerusalem, Behold, your king comes riding on a white horse. Chariot of fire. Is that what he's saying in Matthew 21? How does he come to Jerusalem? <laughs> Let's look at Matthew 21. Matthew 21 and verse 5. Here's what the scripture says. Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you. Not in the one. Humble, humble, humble. And mounted on a donkey, a call the fall of a beast of burden. He comes in the humblest way possible. Ana wajia katika njia ya upole saini. You see, meekness is a distinct Christ-like, a distinctly Christ-like character. He claimed it for himself. He has spoken of him in prophecy. He has placed it throughout his ministry. Christ manifests his meekness supremely at his self Giving on the cross of Calvary. The Apostle Paul tells us about that in Philippians 2. Where he tells us about the Lord Christ. If you look at him from verse 6 even. Though he was in his very nature, God did not consider the equality with God something to be grasped. But he emptied himself. He emptied himself. And then he took the form of a servant. Born in the likeness of man. Verse 8, being found in that human form, he humbled himself, becoming obedient even to the point of death. The meekness of our Lord Christ displays itself supremely in his humble giving of himself at the cross for our sins. But let me pose this question to you. What Paul is raising or bringing about this high Christology of verse 6 to verse 11 is it just doing it to tell us something about Christ and that's it? Not quite. If you look at Paul's letter to the Philippians from chapter 1 and verse 27. He urges Christian unity. We've got to be united as believers, right? Standing together contending for the faith of the gospel. But then in chapter 2, those early verses, 
Paul identifies certain things that don't add a well for our unity. And so he warns us against it. Now he says, whatever we do in the church, will it be encouragement, comfort, love, whatever it is? Must read. Do nothing from selfish ambition. Or from pride conceit. But in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Now Paul is doing two things here. In verse 3, he tells us that selfish ambition, conceit, are the enemy of unity. Humility or meekness, on the other hand, is what promotes Christian unity. Verse 4. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but in the interest of others. So we're not clamoring and fighting and everyone seeking advantage for themselves. We are seeking the advantage of others. That's what Paul is urging upon us. That is how we maintain our unity as believers. In Ephesians 4, verse 2, 3, 4 onwards, where again the Apostle Paul is going to add the unity of the saints. He puts meekness at the foundation of it. So let me ask you, brethren. Whenever there is strife, divisions among us, even as the people of God. If you come to think of it, at the most fundamental level, what is it that we are lacking? Whether it's conflict in families between husband, wife, parents, and children, whether it's conflict in our churches, local churches like this, between believer and believer, or believers and their leaders, or leaders amongst themselves, what is it that sits at the heart of this? Is it not that we have failed to be meek or to act in meekness? Instead, we are clamoring and seeking advantage one over the other. And we want to gain that advantage, even if it hurts the other person. Paul is warning against those things. It's a very practical context, you see. And it is in that context that then he elevates in our eyes the great example of Christ. How was it that Christ is able to be to us the same? It is because he is meek and lowly of spirit. Willing to be treated less than what he deserves. The Bible says when he was in the vile, he did not revile. But when they pulled his 
beer. When the clothes are wrapped cloth around him, and I slapped him, and asked him to exercise his gifts of prophecy, one of knowledge, to tell who is he that has done it. Our Lord Christ answered not a word. That's him. Isaiah speaks of him thus. Like a lamb led to the slaughter or to his shearers, he did not open his mouth. Do you want to be like Christ? Are you claiming to be Christ like even now? Meekness is fundamental to that enterprise. Now let me also tell you very quickly that meekness is not only distinctly a Christian character. It is also an express demand of the gospel. A gospel life is a meek life. So the gospel demands it. So it is an express demand of the gospel. But it is at the same time a veritable fruit of the spirit. And that is as it should be. Those things which the gospel demands, only the spirit produces. In 1 Peter 3 verse 4, what does our brother tell wives? What should be the greatest attraction of a wife to her husband? Is it in how they dress? How they braid their hair? No, in verse 4, Peter says, It is that meek and quiet spirit. When one of us is caught in a sin, in the church like this, and we know the sin. The apostle Paul commands us to go and restore him. In Galatians 6. But he impresses upon us the attitude with which we are to go to them. We don't go say, ha 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 ha. You thought you are the best case that I'm. I am. You are over sheep while I We don't go gloating like We don't make that an occasion for us to display our superior righteousness. The apostle said we go in the spirit of meekness. And what is it that drives our own meekness? Because we are careful that we ourselves are not tempted. Eh? We are very much aware of the sin within us. In numerous passages, meekness is required of us. Even in apologetics, answering the critics of our faith. Second Peter 3 15. Sanctify the Lord Christ in your hearts. And be ready to ask every man 
It is the mark of a true Christian, you see. So Galatians 5 to the tells us that it is among the ninefold fruit of the Spirit. And it is there in every Christian. If you are a Christian, you have this. Essentially, you do. But it is a grace in which every Christian must seek to grow. See? Yes, like you grow in faith, you grow in all these places, you grow in meekness. And God uses means to grow us in, in meekness. You know the struggles he took Moses through. The struggles God took Moses through. From the first time that he wrestled an Egyptian to the ground and kills him. I am the deliverer. See, that seems to be his attitude there. That God took you through a 40 year period of humbling. So when God appears to him, he says, Now go and tell very let my people go. Now he's not going to tell my people to go. Now he's not going to tell my people to go. Now he's not going to tell my people to go. Now he's not going to tell my people to go. Now he's not going to tell my people to go. He sees only his weakness. Oh Lord, I am a star. I do not know how to speak. And yes, meekness is there in every true believer because it is a fruit of the spirit. But God uses me and sometimes it is the tough things of life. Mungu anatumia njia wakati mwingine hali ngumu za maisha to break the remnants of our pride. Kuvunja masalio ya kiburi. To smooth them our rough edges. Na kuweza kuweka sawa zile sehemu ambazo zimekwenda kongo so that they can be saved of us as the same of Moses. Mamba inaweza kusema kwetu sawia na Musa. He was the most he was the biggest man in the face of the earth. Mamba yeye ndiye kwa pole zaidi. Let me, me conclude by saying this. Jesus attaches the promise to meekness. The meek shall inherit the earth. That is counterintuitive to how the world works. The world doesn't think like that. 
But what Jesus says is very true. Think of it this way. Is it not the case that the happiest people in the world, those who enjoy whatever they have in this world, are those who are content? You can have everything the world has to offer. But if your attitude to life is one of arrogance, one of violence, one of killing, no matter what it costs, in your rough with people. You're insensitive, you're not gentle, you're not patient. You are quick with your reactions. One for one, heart for heart, pain for pain. The people like that, no matter how much they have, are the least happy people you ever find. So while they seem to have everything, they seem to enjoy nothing. But those who cast themselves at the feet of God and would receive that which God would give and share it and give thanks to God for it and are sensitive to people, they have better relationships, don't they? They seem to enjoy the little they have and so even though from the perspective of quantity they only seem to own a small portion of the earth yet they have the greatest enjoyment of it and they really are those who are enjoying them in that sense, even now, those who are meek are the ones who are really inheriting But eschatologically, a time is coming when the affairs of this earth are wrapped up. And those who are truly meek will enjoy and inherit the earth in the fullest extent. So meekness pays in this life and in the life to come. May the Lord help us to grow in this beautiful fruit of the Spirit. But it all begins with a humbling of yourself before the Lord Christ. He submitted himself to the cross. He now called upon every sinner to submit themselves to him. Away with your arrogance. Jehuya. Jehuya. To think you can make a way through this life apart from Christ. He calls you today to humble yourself. Come and come. All you that labor and are heavy laden. Now give it. 
take my own bodies and laugh at I am weak and lowly of spirit. May the Lord help me to do that. Our Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for your word. That by it you are able to search our hearts and our minds. To turn us inside out, to show us the deficiencies in our own souls, the end that we might reach out to your grace. Oh Lord, we pray. As you have demanded of us meekness. Produce it in us by your spirit. Grow it in us by whichever means we deem necessary. And forgive us, dear Lord. Where we have not been meek. Where our lack of meekness has caused injury and pain to your people. And even to your church. Oh Lord, we pray. May you grant us this blessing. And make it the means for the advanced unity of our church. And of your people around the world. Hear us, O dear Lord. As we pass these things in Jesus' name. Amen.